when you plant that 200 square yard space, if you're starting from a parking lot or gravel or a lawn or whatever, and you're turning it into a diverse forest with some 30 plant species and counting because all of those plants are going to attract little insects and birds and things like that, you're also creating a really strong natural air conditioning system too because all of those plants will be transpiring water, which is basically they they take the energy from the sun and instead of absorbing it as heat like asphalt would do, they release water like we do when we sweat. So imagine in a place that's got lots of concrete, um, like in the middle of the city, that's already going to be a pretty important local effect of cooling down, you know, some maybe 10 degrees or so inside the forest compared to next to it. Welcome to the Regenerative Real Estate Podcast, a show about human environments and how they can be used as a force for good. Conversations that educate and inspire people looking for a different way to do real estate. I'm Neil Collins, and on the show today, we have writer Hannah Lewis that writes about people, nature, and conservation. Hannah joined me to talk about a recent book she wrote called The Mini Forest Revolution, using the Miyawaki method to rapidly rewild the world. I remember several years ago, I read the book Call of the Reed Warbler by Charles Massey, and it instantly captivated me. The pages contain story after story about how Australian farmers are regenerating vast landscapes back from the brink of collapse using ecological methods such as regenerative grazing, permaculture, and key line design. I became fascinated because of that book with the concept of land regeneration and began to research and daydream about shifting my real estate practice to support similar efforts. I even bought an 80 acre property in Central Oregon that we were intent on using as an experimental site to help springboard biodiversity and combat desertification. But since then, I've come to realize something really important and that's regenerative real estate work is seldom done alone as it takes a community of people to provide the energy, will, and vision to see a project through. And while the thought of regenerating large swaths of semi-arid landscapes and ranch country may seem like a good idea and certainly a necessary one, it might not be for you. That's why I was really excited to dig into the book, The Mini Forest Revolution, because in it, author Hannah Lewis also recounts story after story of communities across the globe coming together to regenerate damaged landscapes and plant forests. It provided me with yet another example of how people are a critical part of the great transformation that we all know is possible and critically needed. To follow along, I thought it'd be first really helpful to introduce you to the late Japanese botanist and ecologist Akira Miyawaki whose work inspired the forest planting method that Hannah based the book on. Miyawaki was able to determine how to restore native forests that grew at a rate about 10 times faster than other non-indigenous forests. And it should come as no surprise that just like regenerative real estate work, the Miyawaki method relies upon a variety of species coming together to create ideal conditions that outperform more conventional forest practices. And better yet, these fast-growing native forests can be planted in a city, in a park, at a school, or even in your backyard. Now, for this podcast, I want to give you a heads up. I was able to connect with Hannah despite being located on two different continents So please excuse any less than ideal audio quality in places.
Okay. Hey, welcome back, everybody. This is another show of the Regenerative Real Estate Podcast. And joining me today, Hannah Lewis. Hannah, thank you so much for taking the time to come on to the show, especially I just learned that Hannah is in France on vacation, maybe visiting family, friends, but uh, regardless, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here as well. Hannah, I've, I've got to tell you, so I was shared your book, The Mini Forest Revolution, using the Miyawaki method to rapidly rewild the world. And I love the title and I, I kind of put it on, on my bedside and didn't get a chance to pick it up until relatively recently. And I just, once I did, it was really hard to put down. And I, I know that we, we should definitely get into that. But I want to first start off with really understanding where you're coming from, because your bio, it says like you've got kids and you, you wrote this book in France, but that you're from the Midwest. And, and I thought a really interesting place to pick this up, because you don't see this combination very often, is that you have a master's degree in sustainable agriculture and sociology from Iowa State. What an interesting combination. How on earth did you end up putting those two together? <laughs> yeah. Well, I I should just give a plug for the graduate program in sustainable agriculture at ISU, which was a really wonderful program that I loved. Um, interdisciplinary. So everybody who enters the program has to find a home department. So that can be sociology, economics, natural resource management, ecology and evolutionary biology, animal science, horticulture, etc. So anything that touches on agriculture in any way. And agriculture is such a huge part of our world that it does touch on a lot of things. So in the sociology department, we talk about sustainable food systems and access to food and who has access to land. And so what I focused on was people who had immigrated to Iowa from agricultural regions, especially in, in Mexico in particular, and that were interested in becoming farmers in Iowa. And that was a cool thing because Iowa has a lot of corn and pigs on a very large industrial scale, but Iowa also has a really thriving local food system. And so there was a place for people to enter the food system as smaller scale producers, which is more manageable if you don't have sort of a way to get access to a large amount of farmland to produce commodity crops. So I, I looked for the people who had agricultural roots and had to leave Mexico for one reason or another and were still drawn to that way of life as a way to produce food for their families and their communities. So how they were integrating into in Iowa context as, as small scale farmers. And that was, that was what I focused on. So that was how so sociology and sustainable agriculture related to each other. Oh, that, that's so interesting. Was it really does seem like land and agriculture is really the bedrock of culture and to pull on that sociology piece. I just think is fascinating. This is where the, the student in me would love to just be a professional at it <laughs> and, yeah, and go yeah. and, and take programs like that. Um, yeah. What were you thinking that you were going to do with, with that degree? Where, where did you see your, the arc of your career going? Well, prior to that, I was working in the, the produce department of a cooperative grocery store in Minneapolis. And we were sourcing from about two dozen local farmers in the Minneapolis area and also we hosted a CSA program. So there were certain farmers that dropped their boxes off and then our customers could come and pick up those boxes. So that wasn't even a transactional thing for the store, but it was a way to support local food systems. We experimented with composting, with a local ag program from the store. So, and then prior to that, my degree was environmental studies with a focus in sustainable agriculture from Middlebury College. and. I had interned on an organic farm. Um, so anyway, that, that's sort of the arc of the career. So it kind of originated in college where I discovered how much agriculture influences our environment, how much ag policy influences the way land is used in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world. 
So the question was how to change that so that we take better care of the land, what policies are needed, what market systems are needed, what institutional support is needed. So that was kind of how it developed in doing that program. I think I was drawn to that that particular focus of immigrants becoming farmers in Iowa in their new home. I think I was just curious about that. I wasn't even necessarily thinking about specifically where that would lead me career-wise. But what it did help me focus on was the needs of beginning farmers generally. So after I graduated, I worked for a national organization that supports small farmers and continued to do programs that supported beginning farmers in terms of access to land and markets and knowledge with a focus on immigrants and refugees who were coming from agricultural backgrounds and wanting to integrate that knowledge into their new life in Iowa. So I actually was able to use that directly in, in the next job I had, which was cool. Uh, that's that's really interesting. Somebody was telling me, it was my late mother-in-law, she was telling me about the refugee community gardens in Anchorage, Alaska. And she was telling me about how it was amazing because you could really tell the different regions and the different styles of agriculture. Mm-hmm. And I just, I was fascinated with how that really comes together and how you can see community forming, even across language barriers, but to, to also see very distinctive practice, agricultural practices, all really in a small space. And it's really yeah. that that environment and th- those ways to, to create community, especially over, mm-hmm. over food. Right. And really, I think the leading edge that I'm so drawn to is, is how communities are really embracing resiliency around those food systems and sovereignty and justice and sustainability. Like it's all really playing out in these local food systems and in these community gardens of all places. Have you seen that yeah. too, or had similar, <laughs> similar experiences? Yeah. yeah. One thing that I remember from Minneapolis, there's a Korean community that had developed a community garden just kind of on their own. Like it was just a sort of abandoned patch of land that was near a large intersection kind of by a highway and there wasn't any sort of program that set it up. It was just people that spontaneously set up this garden. And then they had to move one of the roads. And so there was a huge outcry, not only from the gardeners themselves, but from people around who knew about that garden and really valued it as a part of the community. And so it was it was re, re-situated. But yeah, so that was sort of my first glimpse of another people from another place bringing their their gardening traditions into their new home another cool thing when i was in iowa working on my masters was also the the continuity that it created so like i think for the korean gardeners perhaps they enjoyed gardening but they also probably wanted a way to grow the crops that they were used to that they couldn't find in the grocery stores here and similarly one of the families that I talked to in Iowa, they had a lot of chickens, so they had eggs and things, but they also liked the, the taste of older hens that has had more flavor than the chickens that you can find in the store that were slaughtered at like six weeks old. So there's like less flavor in them than an older chicken. So there was that. And there was also the cheese, like they were used to making their own cheese. And so there's a lot of questions of cultural continuity that you can address by by growing your own food and and being able to produce the things that you can't find in the local grocery stores of your new home. Oh wow. That is really fascinating. And I what I'm really inspired by in in like this is a real estate show and I want I want everybody to to see these linkages. Like sometimes they can be really subtle, but other times I, I really think it's it's really important to underscore this of just how how to continue to bring land into what is the highest and best use. And oftentimes if if you're looking at what does a successful project look like, it's it's how do you bring community together? And how do you bring community together in spaces that they're not there to spend money, but they're there to connect and cultivate really the relationships 
and create vibrant spaces. Like that, that is a successful use of, of space that is really going to, to form how we, we see our relationship with land. And if you come to the United States, the interesting thing that I find is like after living abroad for so many years to then come back, you see just lots of unused, not even unused spaces, but just mismanaged and f- almost forgotten about. And that's why I think whenever I read about the mini forest revolution and community gardens and what's going on with immigration and, and really looking at where the developments that I'm really excited about, how they're bringing in food and, and community, like it all is drawing from the same, same cup, if you will. Uh, or very similar, similar spaces. And, and that's probably a good way into, you wrote this book about mini forest. And before we get into like, what is a mini forest and the method behind it? What was really the intrigue for you into the method and, and this style of, of revitalization is, is probably the best mm. term that I can come up with mm. for it. Yeah. I think I was really, really primed for it when I read a story about a project near where I was living in France. And the reason I was primed for it was because I, well, so I have this sort of long environmental background to my career, but starting in about 2016, when I moved to France, I started working remotely for an organization called Biodiversity for a Livable Climate in the U.S., And so my job was to read scientific articles about the ways ecosystems keep the world livable in terms of regulating water cycles and carbon cycles. So, yeah, we have this problem with too much carbon in the atmosphere, but carbon is really important for life on the land and in the ocean. So, you know, Plants take carbon out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis and they grow that way and they're made up of carbon and then animals eat the plants and we eat animals and plants. And so everything is based on carbon. So carbon is a great thing, but it's just that it's sort of been scraped off the land and released into the the atmosphere and there's too much of it and it's a problem. But ecosystems, so if you have healthy ecosystems, it means you have plants growing well and densely. And, you know, you can imagine a forest, there's lots of photosynthetic surface in a forest, there's tons of leaves. And then you have all of the food chain built up from all of those plants and leaves. And so you're basically bringing carbon back down onto the land where it does a whole lot of good and into the soils where organic matter is is made out of carbon. And so Soils with lots of organic matter support microorganisms in the soil, which then sort of form the structure of the soil and allow it to be porous to absorb water so that when it rains, it doesn't all wash off. It goes in the ground, recharges the aquifers, and then is there, is sort of there in the land for when, in the water table for when you have a drought later on. So anyway, carbon is carbon is great. So when you have healthy ecosystems, you put carbon in the right place and you put you help water slow down and be in be in the right place when you need it. So I was just reading and writing about this and thinking, well, I I love reading and writing, but meanwhile the land is still really degraded <laughs> all around me and everywhere. So what can I do? What can I personally do with my hands? And so I read that article and what was about that project. And it was, a, it was in just outside of the city of Nantes, which is not too far from where I was living. And it was about a couple that planted a 200 square yard native forest near their house. And they, they learned the specific methodology to do this. So there was quite a bit of knowledge built up into it, but then they did it with just, you know, a few dozen people over a one day period of planting. There was a bit of soil prep ahead of time and there was maintenance in the next couple of years following. But then they had a little ecosystem that before had just been lawn. And so it was doable and it was, and it was really eco, ecologically significant you know, to turn lawn into a dense forest, dense native forest was in a few years was a pretty amazing and important thing. So 
So I thought, well, if this couple can lead a project like that, I can probably do something similar to that in my town. So I, I proposed it to the director of the school where my children were attending. And she said, yeah, sounds really cool. You need to go to the, the mayor for that. And the mayor eventually accepted it, the town council. And so it was planted just last December. And so that whole process of discovering that method and trying to put it into practice where I lived just kind of set me on this path. And I, I realized that there were a lot of projects like that all around France and all around Europe even, and then all around the world. So I just reached out to all of those people. It was during the COVID period. So I did lots of interviews by Zoom. And that's, that's how the book came about telling the stories of all those people. Was it pretty explicit that this is uh, following in the lineage and the methodology of Akira Mirawaki? Uh, Mirawaki? Yeah. Miyawaki, yeah. Miyawaki. And he recently passed away last year, which um, I didn't know anything about him until reading, reading your book and just thought it was fascinating really how it's gone from one person in Japan to what seems to be a global movement of, of these many, many forests. But what I think the first thing that came up for me is like, what is really the impacts if, if you're planting like a 200 meter or 200 yard yeah. space seems very approachable, but also really small. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that's, yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. So I, I think one way to look at it is that is in terms of local impacts. When you plant that 200 square yard space, if you're starting from a parking lot or gravel or a lawn or whatever, and you're turning it into a diverse forest with some 30 species and counting, 30 plant species and counting, because all of those plants are going to attract little insects and birds and things like that. So your your it'll be sort of almost an exponential effect on biodiversity right there. So already you're creating a a space for all of those species to live where they didn't have one before. You're also creating a, a sort of a really strong natural air conditioning system too, because all of those plants will be not only creating shade but also transpiring water, which is basically they. They take the energy from the sun and instead of absorbing it as heat, like asphalt would do, they release water like we do when we sweat. They release water and that releases the heat of the sun back up out into the the atmosphere and, and away from the land. So imagine in a place that's got lots of concrete, um, like in the middle of the city, that's already going to be a, a pretty important local effect of cooling down, you know, some maybe 10, 10 degrees or so inside the forest compared to next to it and potentially more of a difference. And then you've also, we also talked about water. So the soil will not be compacted as it is or impermeable as it is on, on a street. It'll be absorbing water. So think of places where we're not getting enough rain. And when the rain does fall, it's really precious. We want to have it absorb into the land rather than wash off into gutters and into rivers and then out into the sea. We want to slow down the process and keep the water there as much as possible to fill up the water table. So there's all of these local effects. And then the other thing about planting one of these is that you do it in a community context. And so Akira Miyawaki always organized forest plantings as community events. And so he would you know, depending on the size of the thing that needed to be planted, that, um, you know, anywhere from dozens to hundreds to even thousands of people at an event. And then people wouldn't just be planting without really understanding what was going on. They would always start with an explanation of the of the method itself and then a naming ceremony. You know, there's a few really important species in each forest that make up the canopy And so the naming ceremony, somebody would hold up one of those little saplings and say the name of that species. 
And then everybody present would repeat that name back. And then there would be tables with a little tiny sapling in a pot on the table and then a picture of the mature tree it would become later. So it, there was a strong education focus, helping people understand the environment that they're living in and what the local species are. So all of those local effects, education, wildlife habitat, cooling, water, et cetera, all of those are already additive. They're already something important locally. And so even if nobody else in the world is planting a mini forest, your little neighborhood has already had a net benefit. So that's one way to look at it. You know, it's, it's never going to be a loss. And the scale, so Paul Hawken wrote the foreword in my book, and he said that to capture all the CO2 from the atmosphere that's been released since 1800, we would need to cover 1 billion degraded acres of earth in mini forest. So that's a lot of mini forests. That's a lot of people, a lot of saplings. But so it's kind of a big picture of what, you know, what would be needed. But luckily there's other, other climate solutions in addition to the Milwaukee method. And what I think makes most sense for the Milwaukee method is, is that local aspect where you're creating adaptation to climate change because you're lowering temperatures in cities and you're, you know, kind of dealing with the potential for flood and drought, but also wildlife corridors through cities. So, you know, you, for eco, for larger ecosystems to survive. So maybe you have a larger project in a vast area outside of a city and another one on the other side of the city. But for those two wilderness areas to survive and thrive, they need to be connected to each other. So because you need the animals to be able to migrate and for the populations to be able to mix genetically. And so if you think of the Milwaukee method as a way to connect diverse habitats through a narrow sort of path, a long strip of land through a city, then that seems like a really appropriate use for that method because it's, you've got the people power in the city, but you don't need to cover a huge area. You can be sort of strategic in terms of connecting the two wilderness areas on either side of the city. And what an incredible bridge between really the otherness that happens between urban and rural. I mean, it, what I picked up on in the book was really those community events. And it the ones that you were describing in the Netherlands, It in my mind, I pictured I've done a lot of running races. And it seemed like, wow, this almost feels like a race where you've got the community coming out and it's early in the morning and the kids are over here doing this thing. And you've got an announcer now that is calling out the names of the trees and everybody's having to repeat it and there's food and there's drinks and games and and it really kind of implanted in me wow this this is a way that you can bring community together and it's a way that we can really combat the probably too rigid of a word but like combat an, an ecological deficiency that we have where we know that our kids are able to identify more logos of corporations than they are of tree species and uh, adults aren't much better I, they're probably they're probably on par with our kids and just how fun that is to see how that community engagement is coming along and i one of the things that i thought was particularly striking is to see how the business community in japan has really spurred this on one of one of the examples that you talked about was when i think it was miyawaki was working with Toyota and they wanted a mini forest planted at one of their industrial manufacturing centers. And he said, look, if these trees die, shut this place down because these trees have evolved with people in the area for hundreds of years. And they had to think about it. What an amazing way to bring different sectors of society, including the business sector together towards revitalization, rewilding. Yeah. Yeah, that was Nippon Steel, and that was the very first forest that Milwaukee did. 
And he, it's, yeah, it's fun hearing him tell the story because he's kind of teasing himself and how he was just a young professor and he was daring to <laughs> make such a proposition to the CEO of this large cup corporation. But he, it really set the tone for his career because he didn't have the slightest interest in working with any organization or company that was just going to greenwash, you know, he wanted people to be as serious as he was and to really understand the importance of, of ecosystems and restoring ecosystems and connecting people to nature. So he really insisted not only that those companies take care of the forest, like really do it well, the method has, has a lot of key steps. And if you should take a shortcut on any of them, it's not going to really work out too well. So you need to really be serious about the method in order to have it work out and to grow well. So he needed them to be to understand that to be serious, but also for the CEOs of the corporation, all the management level to, to be willing to plant alongside. So they're not just kind of up there giving orders to people to be planting, but they're actually planting, they're getting their hands dirty, they're doing it alongside everybody else. So they're demonstrating the importance of what's going on and walking the walk too. Yeah. And what a what a way to help people understand their the local place and not just of like what's growing now. And another example from Japan that I thought was so stark along the coast, the pines were growing and one might assume that is what the native species are, but you really bring in, you know, you've got to go back almost a, a, to a, a time whenever we wouldn't have altered the landscape so drastically. Some of the just amazing examples that you used of, of like sacred forest and temples and like using these historical contexts. And I'd love for you just to maybe tell the listeners about, you know, how some of these people are even learning what tree species used to survive and thrive in these areas. Yeah. In some places, I think it's really tricky. And you have the example of the pines in Japan, at some point, a few hundred years ago, people started planting pines along the coast as a way to block the wind and the sand from the farms just inland because the pines grow fast and they grow well on the sandy soil. So it worked for that purpose. But since it's been a few hundred years, then you kind of assume it's always been like that because your parents, your grandparents, everybody knew it as that. And it's just sort of in the local memory. But what uh, Milwaukee discovered, because he had studied this idea of potential natural vegetation in Germany, where the idea is that, yeah, the potential natural vegetation is what would be growing according to the soils, according to the current climate, according to the topography in a, in a given place, if there were no human disturbance. And so that's the guiding idea for his method is figuring out the potential natural vegetation. And so when after studying that concept, then he, he came back to Japan and he thought about the temple, the shrine forest in his hometown near Hiroshima, which was a farming village, and how there was just this like big, glorious oaks that were hundreds of years old and how it had a very distinct look, the shrine forest. And it occurred to him that that given how old it was, and Shinto, the Shinto religion is, I think, a few thousand years old. And so these shrine forests have been on the landscape for a few thousand years. And so it's like a snapshot of what would be over the entire Japanese archipelago if, if, if it hadn't been transformed to cities and farms, etc. But it took some thinking because, I mean, nowhere is anybody really thinking about this idea of potential natural vegetation and what grew around the area in Tokyo where he ended up teaching at Yokohama University which was in the sort of the greater region around Tokyo, was what was growing was deciduous trees and pines, sort of a mix of things. And people assumed that was the native vegetation of the area. But he thought, actually, in this area, it can tolerate evergreen vegetation because 
it never dips below a certain temperature in the winter. And so the trees that can survive in this area can hold their leaves through the winter because it's a mild winter in this area. But those trees weren't growing. It was deciduous. And so then he looked in the shrine forest in that area and he saw that indeed they were evergreen trees growing there. So it confirmed his understanding that region was suited for evergreen vegetation because of the mild winters. And so then then he kept looking and he saw that those deciduous forests were maybe secondary, and but they were going along the track of ecological succession. So you saw that the native vegetation was actually germinating in the understory of those deciduous forests so that they were on their way to becoming the evergreen forests that they once were just naturally. And so what the Milwaukee method does is it says, okay, what is the potential natural vegetation of this area? And let's figure that out based on climate, topography, soil, based on historical records, based on local knowledge as well. And then let's plant the species that would be growing at the end of a long period of ecological succession, like the evergreens in that greater Tokyo region. Hey, this is Neil, and we're going to get back into the episode in just a second. But before we do, I want to try something out that we've never done before on this podcast. Since creating the show, we've heard how regeneration is not only possible within agriculture and farming, but also in design, construction, planning, and even finance. We've heard about how people are helping to revitalize landscapes, springboard biodiversity, create healthy homes, heal trauma, create access for all, and bring communities closer together. Now, this is not the work of large institutions and governments. It's usually small impassioned firms and organizations working locally. And it's precisely this kind of work that I think plants the seeds of inspiration that spreads to other communities. Since the podcast is growing more each episode, I want to open up the opportunity for organizations like yours, the ones doing regenerative work, to be able to spread the word about your efforts. That's why on the podcast page of our website, we now have a way that you can record up to a 30-second voice message about the work you're doing free of charge. They'll be aired on this show and aired to our audience. To do so, visit choose forward slash podcast. I can't wait to hear from you. Now let's get back to the episode. What's interesting is we see out of the environmental movement right now, so many pledges of if you buy this, we'll plant a tree. And the focus, it seems, is quantity. We need a billion trees to, to combat climate change. And this is, a. it feels like a different approach to say, if you were just throw up the wrong kind of tree, that's not going to get us really to where we want to go. And I'm making, <laughs> this is just coming off of the tip of my tongue as, as you're talking about it, because it, it's really understanding place to a much deeper level. And I'm curious how you see this playing out as we've got global weirding going on and shifting baselines and we're starting to see regions be much warmer than they once were. And so how to think about the Milwaukee method in that context of a changing climate? Yeah, it definitely complicates it. So in Minnesota, there's been research that um, where I live now, the southern southwest portion is tall grass prairie. And then there's a strip of hardwood forest northwest to southeast. And then the upper northeast is boreal forest. So it's pine and shorter birch and things that are shorter lived. And so the research is showing that actually this, the ecosystem of Kansas, more like completely tall grass prairie, is going to be migrating up to that area. And already yeah. Yeah, let's get there's back to the episode. a few counties in northern Minnesota that the temperature has changed more than any other counties in the whole U.S., maybe apart from Alaska. But 
so the temperature has already changed, I think, a couple of degrees, whereas the average globally is more like one degree and in some places less. So what they saw was there was a wildfire that went through northern Minnesota and the pines, the pines and birches burned down. And what was growing back was maple, was the hardwood species from that slightly lower band. So they were already moving up into that warmer area. They were already expanding north. And so when I think about that in relation to the Milwaukee method, which talks about potential natural vegetation as being related to the current climate, not the past climate, not the future climate that we're anticipating, but actually the current climate. So I would say if you were going to do a Milwaukee forest in that place where the, actually the maples are growing where it used to be boreal forest, you would probably plant that hardwood forest that's based on maples, even though that's not the native species of that area. But other parts of the U.S. and other parts of the world have not changed that much, and the climate is still pretty similar. So in that case, you could plant the native species that have been there for a long time because the climate is still close enough to what it was that those species are still going to be the ones that will grow the best and be the, be the strongest and best suit for that area now. <laughs> and so what we want to do is grow forests really well right now because they need to do a lot of work right now. <laughs> they need to support wildlife now and they need to car capture carbon and create stability now. And in some places, they're doing that. In Minnesota, they're doing that. They're planting species they think will grow well in the future, doing experiments with what, what is going to be the hardiest now and in the future. But my, my understanding of the Milwaukee method is that it's best to grow probably still in most places, still the native species that have been there in the past that will still grow there now. Um, and I guess one other thing with that is, I think what it can also do is help those particular species migrate north. You know, so if you think of that Minnesota context, if you have a lot of that hardwood species growing where it has historically grown, those seeds will be propagating and those seeds will be available to blow or be transported by animals north little by little. Whereas if you didn't have them there, the seeds wouldn't be there to go north on their own. So I, I think that's another aspect of planting the current vegetation and current native vegetation in a certain place. It really underscores, I think, the, the reciprocity that we really try to get at between people and place. Uh, we do have a role to play, especially as it relates to how what is going on with the climate and how are we selecting these tree species. And this feels a lot like Whenever I first heard about holistic management that the Savory Institute's doing about how to really restore grasslands through grazing, I became fascinated and I even bought an 80 acre property out in the high desert in Oregon because I wanted to experiment with that kind of a revitalization work. And this is a whole new approach because I love how you can bring it into the cities. Like this potential to rewild is underneath the pavement and it can be done in a backyard or a park or at a school and it brings community together. So where do you think it's going to go from here now that you bring in examples from Africa and from India and Japan to Europe? Do you see this continuously picking up speed? What would you say the future looks like with the Miyawaki method and many forests. Yeah, I think it has a huge growth potential because the people that I interviewed for the book sort of discovered it on the early end. And like me, they were already primed to really receive the idea, to really understand it and have it click because it answers questions that we're already asking. How can I reduce the heat island in my city or at my school? How can I help the these species that are threatened find a like a little place to live? <laughs> and how can we help people understand their ro role in relation to nature? And it answers all of those questions. So anybody who's asking questions like that 
I think is going to respond well to the Miyawaki method, to learning about it. And the, and the, the way it has grown just in the time that I've been paying attention. So in, in the Netherlands, they started in, at the end of 2015 with their very first forest. And by the end of this year, they will have planted 230 forests, all in collaboration with schools all across the country. And that's only the school-based projects. They've also had interest from private citizens, from even from architects and developers. And uh, so that's a really good example. I was just in Lyon in France, where they planted their first forest a year and a half ago. And now they have four and they have two more on the docket for this coming winter. So I think like the way it seems to roll out is people say, okay, this is an idea that is credible because it's has 50 years already of success in Japan and elsewhere in the world. And now it's been successfully experimented with in Europe and other ecosystems. So it's it's really a valid method. But will let's see, will it work here? Do we have the right expertise to make it happen? And then after the first the first forest that a community plants, they say, well, that, that grew pretty fast. It's really beautiful. It was fun. The kids learned something. Let's try it again. And let's especially look at the neighborhoods that have less green space and a higher heat island effect. And let's target those areas. And so it has lots of applications. And once people start to get comfortable with it, I think it, I think it rolls out pretty quickly. What a big boost as well, the foreword by Paul Hawken. How did that linkage come together? <laughs> I was lucky that Chelsea Green, I mean, Chelsea Green, the publisher, has been really a wonderful group to work with, friendly, responsive. They do a super great job. And so they were the ones that reached out to Paul Hawken, thinking that the mini forest idea fits well with his idea of blessed unrest, you know, this sort of like spontaneous environmental action happening at very local levels that people are understanding things and figuring out a way to improve the situation locally. And that's, and then when he looks at that globally, it's like a giant movement. And so he calls it blessed unrest. And I think also um, in relation to drawdown, the idea of drawdown. So he's also put together a list of all sorts of different climate actions that we can take that that will have a tangible effect. So Chelsea Green had the foresight to think that it might appeal to him, and it did. And so I was very lucky that he was willing to write such a nice foreword. Yeah, it tied it together so beautifully. And I just I have to just reiterate to everybody that is tuning in, please get a copy of The Mini Forest Revolution. I have thoroughly enjoyed reading it. I had a lot of different interesting connections that we don't have time for on this show, unfortunately, but I spent a little bit of time in graduate school in India working on a couple projects there. And uh, they have these ancient step wells. They harvest rainwater and groundwater and just learning a little bit more about that architecture as well as we're connected with a group called SEWA, the Self-Employed Women's Association. And they do a lot of women-led tree nurseries as a form of empowerment, as well as reforestation. And it started to make all these really interesting connections for me of, of really this experiential learning that, that has gone on for a decade now. But it, it's got these great tones of hope and inspiration and accessibility that I just think that we need more of. And I hope that it, this book, I would imagine it'll be very generative in that more will come as a result. So I just, I can't thank you enough for putting it out to the world and doing the research that you did because it must've been a really fun project to research as well. Oh, it was so fun. It was really fun. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. I loved every minute. Well, Hannah, thank you so much for coming on to the Regenerative Real Estate Podcast. But before I do let you go, I want to ask about the Compendium of Scientific and Practical Findings Supporting Eco-Restoration to Address Global Warming. That is something that in your bio, it says that you edit, and it, that must come from the academic world because a title like that. Yeah, only- it's a very long title. That uh, That's the work that I mentioned at the beginning where I work for 
I was working for biodiversity for a livable climate when I discovered the Milwaukee method. And so that compendium series is trying to bring together all the different scientific articles, but also stories like journalistic stories about projects that are going on. Soil science to hydrology to yeah ecology and weather, all these different disciplines have something to say about the beneficial effects of healthy ecosystems. So the idea of the compendium series is to bring together all of those articles and to organize them by theme. So ecosystem connectivity was a theme and riparian, riparian floodplain systems was another theme. Forest biodiversity was another theme. So basically thinking about ecosystems theme by theme and as it relates to a healthy climate. So that's that's what that project is all about. Yeah, I went to the website and I thought, wow, this is fascinating that there's this whole new discipline of ecosystem restoration that 20 years ago, it would be really hard to find any kind of scientific journal about this. And then whenever I saw it in your bio, I was like, I've got to go check that out. But we will link it in the show notes. Hannah, thank you again for coming on. This has been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed talking to you. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the show today. If you want to follow our work at Latitude, you can follow us on Instagram at latitude.regenerative.re and mine is at I am Neil Collins. We inherently believe in the potential that comes from connecting value-aligned and purpose-driven people together in community. That's why I encourage you to join our mighty network and introduce yourself to the other people working across the globe to advance a more regenerative, resilient, and beautiful world. Here, we want to know what you're working on and what inspires you. Through this platform, you can attend live events, take courses provided by our podcast guests, and create connection with other people and businesses that share your same passion. To join, find the link in our show notes or visit our website at ChooseLatitude.com. If you'd like to support the show, please share it with your friends and be sure to follow us on your podcast app so that you always have the latest episode downloaded. Another way to support our regenerative field building is to leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Positive ratings help attract amazing guests, and they can be the deciding factor for someone else to tune in and listen. And who knows? Maybe this is the kind of motivation that it takes for them to finally decide to align their profession with their sustainable and regenerative values and become a positive force for good within their own community. This show was produced by myself and edited by Anthony Wallace and offered as a part of our work with Latitude Regenerative Real Estate.